You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hey everybody, welcome to TV Guidance Counselor. I am Ken Reed. As always, your TV Guidance Counselor here to talk about classic television using back issues of TV Guide Magazine as the gateway into the difficult viewing choices of our collective past. And this week is an incredibly fun episode. We went went local with a local talent made good. Uh, Mr. Chuck Hogan, he is a writer. You may know him as the writer of the novel Prince of Thieves, which became the movie the town uh which is a great movie very bostony and in the best possible way uh also he wrote or co-wrote with guillermo del toro who is one of my absolute favorites uh the strain novels which was also a, an excellent tv series and just a cool guy uh really just an amazing person anyone who sort of uh is able to make it creatively uh from here uh, always impresses me, especially if they're still here for whatever reason. Uh, and, and he is no exception to that rule. Uh, if you haven't read his books, absolutely do. You will not be disappointed. Uh, speaking of not being disappointed, uh, you can email me. I don't know how those two things relate. I don't really think they do, but you can email me at TV guidance counselor, gmail.com or Ken at I can read.com. I can read.com of course, being my stand-up comedy page. I am an on hiatus stand-up comedian and have been for the last, I don't know, 15 months, something like that. Uh, you could have had two children. I don't know the math. You could have had two children since the last time I did stand up. Um, but I, eventually I'll be back. So you can go there or TV guidance counselor, gmail.com. Let me know what you think of the show. Let me know if there's guests you'd like to hear on the show. I will attempt to get them. I'll do my best. Uh, or if there's anything else you want to tell me, let me know how you're doing. Let me know if you're vaccinated, if you're going out, if you're doing stuff, um, you know, whatever or not, you don't have to. You can also go to our Patreon, patreon.com backslash TV guidance counselor you can give a buck there thousand dollars a month whatever you want to do uh or nothing uh have some exclusive content on there and it's it's a fun time speaking of fun times sit back relax and enjoy this week's episode of tv guidance counselor with my guest chuck hogan tv is my friend and it has been always there for me And live via satellite from the same state that I'm in, because that's the world we live in now. Chuck Hogan, how are you? Great, Ken. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Uh, we think were... about think about everything that's going into bouncing this signal. What are we? Twenty miles away. Yeah, but, uh, it's going to up to Mars and looping around Saturn and coming back down to to this uh, to the beautiful state of Massachusetts. But anyway, is there anything more uh, outrageously human than that? <laughs> Not really, no. I mean, you, you get this technology. We're, so we're, we're going to go back to 1984. And yep. anything approaching this is so super sci-fi and ridiculous. And now we have it. And it's, I mean, I don't know about you. I use my phone the same percentage as, as I use my brain, about 6%. I use, you know, texting, calling, and that's about it. Whereas, you know, it's got all the computing power. Of, oh, yeah. Of the, you know. It's the sum total knowledge of human history. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. And it's, yeah. it's, I mean, it's basically a tricorder from Star Trek. <laughs> right. Which, 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 which honestly makes it so awesome that we're talking about TV guides. I mean, it's uh, it, it actually is great because why not go all the way around, come back to, you know, mass media the way it used to be where you'd have to get this little digest and you'd check off your shows and try to figure it out instead of just typing it in. Yeah. That's what it, I always say about like those of us that grew up pre-millennium, no matter how different we were, we had this shared experience, whether we wanted it or not, because you were forced to watch all the same stuff, even if you didn't want to, because that was, you, you had no other choice. You couldn't just watch whatever you wanted, whenever you want, like you no. can now. That was the other thing. I mean, everyone had to watch it at the same time too, you know? So it was, you know, not only were you trying to tune into what other people were maybe watching, but it was happening all at the same time. So there was this sort of like, to me, in my, I was 16 in 84. It was like a universe that was television and like everyone sort of had a role and every sort of show had a little, you know, part in this world that I was, I had a window to, we had one television in my, in my house and, um, and yeah, everything was just sort of happening and you would tune in and you would tune out. And, uh, 
yeah, I mean, I have four kids today and they have no sense of, you know, I mean, they're time shifting and they're streaming and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh no, like it, it was, you had to grab it while it was going by like a brass ring on a carousel or else you missed it. Uh, yeah, that's months. weirdly, it, this will sound stupid that that hadn't occurred to me till you just said this right now. But the idea that when we were growing up, it was happening whether you were there or not. <laughs> Which is a pretty simple concept, but in my 2021 look back seems crazy yeah. because everything seems, you know, it's literally on demand, <laughs> but then it was like, oh no, that shows to be on if you watch it or not. Like no one exactly. cares about you. <laughs> it, exactly. it made us realize no one cared about us. And we're, and we're going back to June, which is all like reruns, which, yeah. you know, was terrible. But at the same time, it was your only chance to maybe catch something that you missed. Otherwise it's gone. I don't yeah. know. I'm, I'm sure you remember when YouTube was like new on the internet and all of a sudden like old TV shows were popping up and even like old news things that you couldn't see otherwise. And all of a sudden you could dial it up. Um, it was the most amazing thing. I mean, I, yeah. I, I never get tired of it, but now I'm used to it, but it was so cool to be all of a sudden I'm watching the intro to the bionic woman, which I haven't seen in, you know, 20 years. I'm like, Oh man, this is great. Like, who did this? You know? Cause I remember growing up, you would hear about the, I think it's the museum of television and radio down in New York. Yep. That's like a library. So you go in and you're like, I want to watch Ernie Kovacs from 1956. And you fill out a form and you sit in a booth and you watch it. And that seemed incredibly exotic and yeah. well worth I, the effort. I did that. I did that once in uh, 1994, I was in New York and I wanted to do exactly that. I went in there. I mentioned the bionic woman, but I actually pulled up the uh, $6 million man, the first episode and which i hadn't seen since i was you know a kid it was my favorite show of all time and i and i sat there with these headphones on in like a library and and watched it and it was really cool and now yeah i could do that on the bus uh i could do that on a plane go we fly to sri lanka i mean it, you know it's 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 so available it's crazy could you imagine explaining to your kids that when you, in 1994, when you're what 26, you went to a physical YouTube? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> like I had to go into the YouTube. Exactly. <laughs> Again, it's it. like yeah, I had to go get it, or else it was going to pass me by. And I was thrilled to go get it. I'm like, this is this place is great, man. Oh you know, yeah, old TV shows. Like uh, you know, not knowing uh, where are we now? Third, not even 30 years later, uh, it would be you know in my pocket. Uh, yeah. And oh I yeah. Can carry around that museum with me. There's some stuff that's so rare, like they only have it there, but not a lot. Mm. Like you can yeah. access pretty much everything that they have. And even in the last year, YouTube and that stuff has gotten even better about stuff. Like there are, um, like legendary unsold pilots. Like I used to be a tape trader right. for years and stuff that it was like, man, if I could get a hold of that, they're all just on YouTube. Now they don't take them down. They're just yeah. there. I'm like we could just, you could just see this. I know. <laughs> is insane and he's definitely i mean obviously you you actually feel the same you definitely loses something and it's like it was the same thing with movies you know revival houses and you go see a movie that you'd heard about from 1966 and it was your one chance and you showed up and you paid your money and you saw it or you didn't and um you know it was really really exciting and i loved having everything at my fingertips but people do miss out on that you know that sort of church-like experience of you gotta i gotta go there on a tuesday night it's 1130 at night, but it's worth it. I'm telling you, you know, and you go see it and you ramped up and it's great. And it's an experience. Yeah. I think that's why we remember this stuff a little bit more oh, as yeah. well. Um, so we're looking at 84 here. We got June 9th to the 15th, 1984. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the year before Spencer for hire started, which was when Hollywood came to Massachusetts. Right. <laughs> Although you, when you were a little bit younger, they would have been doing James at 15 here which was yep. 79, that's, 80 around there. That's too, no it's too high end. Um, <laughs> but, but that seemed even crazy. Like to even have that oh, yeah. close by was just like, I heard they're shooting things here. Oh man. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was, it uh, was, uh, my parents, we were, uh, the, took us into Boston one day in 1978, I believe. And we literally turned the corner and stumbled into the shooting of the Prince job. Yes. Peter Falk. And uh, we were way back, you know, but they're shooting a movie and I was 10 and I was, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, this is what it takes to shoot a movie. And it was so, so cool. Um, but yeah, that was, I mean, it was unheard of. Not like nobody, you know, it was so rare for, for any sort of production to be in Boston. So much the, like the stuff that you've written obviously takes place in New England 
a good amount of it. Do you feel like you were obligated, not obligated, but did you want to do that because you're like, we didn't get enough of stuff that's, <laughs> why did I say that like I'm Mario? We didn't get enough of stuff. Uh, <laughs> we didn't get enough stuff that was said here when we were growing up or just because you've written what you know? No, you know what? But actually it was the opposite. Like for me, I was, I was, I started writing for the same reason I like to read, like like get away from myself. First book was set in um, Montana. My second book was set in the future in Atlanta, and because um, I kind of knew the area, you know, I'm yeah. like, ah, whatever. But actually, but my third book was became the movie The Town, and um, I really got into it. And I realized, wow, I know a lot about this this area, and I'm always walking around, you know, looking down an alley and saying oh, that'd be a cool place to find a dead body and stuff. And then I got to actually do that. And then uh, I kind of turned the corner and I came back around and I realized, yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, instead of trying to run away from what I know, let me go deeper into uh, what I know in, in my own backyard and kind of explore that. Cause I'm always, you know, Stephen King has famously uh, praised your work and um, we'll get into the guy in a second here. Sorry. Um, but it's, it's funny to me how, <laughs> I arguably what the most popular author in the world, Stephen King, probably in history. Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah. His stuff is so Maine. <laughs> like it's so specifically yep. Maine in New England. And almost nobody seems to take the lesson from that that now if you're writing micro, it actually has more appeal. <laughs> right. In a weird way. Um yeah. don't know why, but it seemed to work. Um, his uh his his books are sort of the same thing that you do here with the TV guy, like going back and looking at it. Like if you read one of his books, you know, written in 1978, you get so much 1978 because he was literally, he was grabbing everything I feel and throwing it into it. And it's such a cool time capsule. I love going back and reading his early stuff because uh, I was young then and you forget all the stuff that, uh, that existed. Yeah. And that's what scared me the most about his stuff too, as like a avid TV watcher, like he'd mentioned TV guide. He'd yeah. mentioned like when you were reading horror real. books, yeah, it was real. It was like, I remember, I forget what book it was, but it was somebody gets killed and they're watching Johnny Carson. <laughs> and as a kid, there was something very comforting about watching stuff like Johnny Carson. We were like, well, this is like, this is my real world. The, the horror movies, that's not real. If you see a movie, it'll be like a fake talk show or something. But to have like a real thing that you watch was absolutely terrifying. You're like, oh, it's not safe. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that that is that universal sort of shared experience that we all have. Oh. And on the cover here, we have future uh, James Bond, <laughs> no. Pierce Brosnan of Remington Steel fame. It's so funny that they were talking about him as Bond way back then, which seemed ridiculous. He's a t he's on a TV show. There's no way, no way. But then, of course, Roger Moore had been like the saint on TV, you know, yeah. in the in the '60s and, and made it up there. But um, yeah, the, uh, Pierce Brosnan of it all. Remedy Steel was was great. I mean, it was a, such a great such a great concept. I think you know she needed like a she needed a male she needed like a figurehead for her private eye yeah. firm. Right. And uh, he kind of played the, uh, played the role. And that's just fun. He was an actor. Yeah. Like no one took that's her right. seriously. She's a woman, private sex. She hires this actor to play a fake owner of this thing, which I cannot believe has not been rebooted because yeah. that is such a 21st century concept for right. a show. <laughs> um, and yeah, he actually didn't do the Timothy Dalton movies. He was offered them, but he was still under contract for Remington steel. Wow. He couldn't get out of it. And so Dalton got those two movies wow. and Pierce Brosnan was still doing Remington steel. And it was that kind of thing where the last season of Remington steel, you can tell in every shot he's in how mad he is <laughs> that he has to do Remington steel he's jammed up on 20 episodes a year. So yeah. yeah, I know. Could be I'm James sure. Bond right now, but then you have someone like Patrick McGowan of the prisoner who turned down James Bond. <laughs> Did he really? He was offered it before Sean Connery. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Because he was secret yeah. agent man and um right. and he was like, no. But also Patrick Pergoon was a nutcase. Uh <laughs> in the best possible way. Uh also before we get to the listings in here, there is an amazing ad. I don't know if you saw, but it's uh it's sponsored by Milk. And it's Vincent Price. <laughs> With yes. a with a carton of milk, and it says Vincent Price invites you to the three hundred thousand dollar reel, and it's a milk contest with Vincent Price sort of as the face of it for some weird reason. 
and you can win three hundred thousand dollars as the as the grand prize, or you also could win an ice cream parlor. <laughs> when you think of milk, you think of <laughs> of Vincent Price. I don't know. He literally, I mean, it's it's kind of crazy that at the towards the end of his amazing career, he was so great. I mean, I just, he he didn't say no to anything. He no. said, he, I mean, obviously, Milkat uh, literally said no. He just kept going as long as he could. And that's kind of cool, too. I remember in uh, Edward Scissorhands, I mean, he can barely, he's just really frail, you know, but he's, I mean, so glad he's in it. He's yeah, so cool. He's perfect but, um, in that. Yeah. I mean, he was doing Tylex ads and yep. Kodak. He hosted a football bloopers video in 1985. <laughs> it was just like the most weird. What do you think football? Yeah, good old but but then again, people went to him. Like like who you know who was it who was like spitballing like hmm, that's probably Sydney football. Yeah, that makes sense. Perfect. I'd like to see that list, like because he clearly wasn't number one. I hope not. It was probably like like Dick Butkus. Uh, Patrick yep. McGowan, <laughs> Pierce yeah, Brosnan, yeah, exactly. and then Vincent Price. Oh, um, yeah. I'm actually surprised Vincent Price never made it into a Bond movie. Well, think, Christopher yeah. Lee did. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Christopher yeah, Lee, yeah, Donald yeah. Pleasance, like yep. even, like most of those guys. Um, and then we have the article here, which you and I talked about when we were first uh, talking about doing the show, which is really fascinating. It's the anatomy of a failure, uh, and it's talking about square pegs, and it's a really great article. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so you'll have to help me understand this. Like, TV Guide was not known for its hard-hitting expose. It's like, I don't know why. It's so strange to me that they went in on a show, especially a show that had been off the air for a year. I, I just, I don't understand it. But yeah, I mean, it was kind of compelling. Although their main witness, if you will, was this guy who had embezzled money from the set. There's a yeah, lot of- Not reliable. Of <laughs> yeah, it's clearly not reliable. And then he- Wound up in the hospital. I, I, I don't know. There was a lot of weird stuff there. But I mean, uh, it, it doesn't take much for me to want to go back and watch some square pegs. And this article did that. So I'm, I go back to square pegs thinking it must have been this just, you know, cocaine fueled, you know, crazy yeah. show where everyone's just scratching their their uh, their arms and jib jab. I mean, and it's it's like such a laid back, such like a like a friendly, like a warm, comfortable, you know, show. Kind of seemed edgy at the time, but that's because yeah, I was younger and it felt like it was speaking right to me. But it's like, you know, it's outcast in school and it's a really relaxed space. And I just I'm not saying it didn't happen. I just I just I don't I don't get it. It, it doesn't it doesn't add up really. No. Like you're it's it's freaks and geeks, that show basically. It, yeah. It's sort of you know yeah. with a laugh track, but Sarah Jessica Parker's first thing, people haven't seen it. Um, it's pretty ahead of its time. You have two female uh teenage girls as the main characters, which we didn't yep. really get. Um but yeah, it's this article to your point is all like this show ended because everyone was out of their mind on Coke and banging yeah. each other, basically, <laughs> um, which since I started doing this show, I've more or less confirmed. Uh, so I've had a uh, Devo really? on the show and Devo guest starred yeah. on one of the episodes and, oh, uh, an episode. Yeah. which is a great episode. It and is. Jerry was like, Oh, those kids were out of their fucking minds on cocaine. That's, that is so <laughs> like, wild. Like, All right, well, I mean, and, and then I had yeah. Ann beats on who, who wasn't, who, who recently died, but, um, yeah. she wasn't, quite as uh candid as jerry was but pretty much said the same thing um although she told me a crazy story like lauren michaels is notoriously uh, just like an evil weirdo <laughs> and i have a million stories of him being a bastard to people but uh she basically thinks he got square pegs canceled so really? they had done this big interview with the whole cast and her and rolling stone it was going to be a cover story and it was this whole huge thing and she said, she goes, you know, it was really my fault because I was at a party and I mentioned it to Lauren and I was flying back to LA. And by the time I landed, our show had been canceled and I was off the cover of Rolling Stone. And later she found out that Lauren called the, <laughs> the editor of Rolling Stone. And all he said was, uh, you know, when I was in the magazine, I wasn't on the cover. <laughs> and then they just dumped the whole thing. Really? So she was you, like. You yawn winner yeah um i wow well that i mean i i i don't know what to say i'm speechless i mean i mean i can't first of all i mean again having watched the show i'm like it's just so bizarre to me 16 year olds um co I, I guess i mean it's I 83 guess it could be. 84 oh my gosh. I, mean, I mean it's so 80s you know i i uh i just finished uh lorraine newman's autobiography oh, it's and great it was just it's so great but she reminded me 
of how, you know, cocaine went from this sort of, you know, drug that seemed like it was fueling a lot, like Fridays on ABC yeah. was a show that was, was seemed to be sponsored by cocaine. And, uh, and all of a sudden it became a problem and then people were going to rehab and, you know, she kind of went through that same thing. And, um, and I guess that was happening at this time in the television because the only other TV guide expose that I recall, uh, the only other time I, I recall just doing anything negative about television, which I'm sure was their prime advertiser was the Lauren Tweez thing from Love Boat. Right. And she also had a uh, drug issue and they were like all into that. So um, I don't know if it's, I don't, I, I overthink it, but I like, is the TV guide editorial, are like all these little old ladies who you know, really want to go after, you know, well, teach them. We're going to teach them a lesson. Just, yeah. Cheers and Jews about, yeah. you know, this and that. Well, it's I mean, very judgmental. At the TV. Oh yeah. TV guy could get super bitchy. Like if it was, especially if it wasn't anything, anyone had sort of sign like cheers and jeers or like show descriptions, it gets super bitchy, but like, okay. Those exposés had a byline, and I think the big difference was, whereas you know the way celebrity and television is now, they were always like, um, like, uh, um, like debriefs. They would always do these exposés well after the fact. Happened, so yeah. it was like, here's what we think happened. It was never contemporary. It was never like gossip in the moment. So I think that's how they were able to sort of because there's in the same year there was a big article about um, John Eric Hexum who had shot himself on the oh, set. Oh yeah, I remember that. Um, and and they did a big expose on that. Mm -hmm. And I mean that that poor guy was just like basically not the brightest dude <laughs> um and and you know but they had this huge thing about safety on sets and uh -huh. um in, in a bunch of stuff that was later cited when the brandon lee thing happened because it was almost the mm -hmm. same exact thing yep. um and, and that was all all after the fact too but that was closer to the actual event than anything else that i think i've read right. on tv guide um so so i think that's how they separated themselves <laughs> a little bit but yeah, uh, I, yeah I'm, I'm going to I'm going to choose to, I hope to try to forget about that article and just, and then I'll just go back to, uh, to enjoying uh, it. John. Pegs. Yeah. And just, yeah. and just be like, Oh man, it was just, cause like I was, I mean, I was 16 and I had never seen a drug in my, in my yeah. entire life. It was so, you know, I mean, everything was crazy distant, but the thought of anyone on the square pegs, you know, being anything other than, a geek or you know funny flashes well those you know, actors were so good at it hotels. the waitresses the yeah. theme song and oh, uh, so oh good God, I love it. and like it those characters, those actors were so good at embodying those characters you couldn't imagine yes. them being any other way nope. and you know we grew up in the just say no sort of dare scare tactic drug era. So we would expect like, if someone's like, okay, I'm like, we're going to know, I mean, they're going to be crazy. Absolutely. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you have an ax in their hand and oh going out. Gosh. <laughs> How are they even working? Um, which, you know, less than zero taught us otherwise. Right. Um, so let's jump in here. Saturday night. Okay. Uh, it's June. Did you have a bedtime when you were growing up? Well, it's 16. You probably don't. 16, I mean, not really, I mean, not really. I mean, uh, I'm 16. I'd like to think we're starting on Saturday night. I mean, mm -hmm. God willing, I hope I had something else to do. On TV, but <laughs> most likely, I mean, 16, you can't drive anywhere, you know, unless someone's mom's going to take us to go see Ghostbusters, I'm probably at home. So, uh, but no, I was actually staying up later and later. I was, uh, I remember making a deal with my parents way back. I was like 12. It was like the late seventies. I really wanted to watch Saturday Night Live, and as we were saying earlier, the only way to watch it was to be there at eleven thirty. And you know, I was twelve, but I made a deal with them. I'm like, I'm going to get this, these, I'm going to get all A's, and if I do that, can I stay up and watch Saturday Night Live? And they're like, Yes, okay, I'm like, great. All right, now I just I have to, yeah, I can watch it until my next report card comes out. <laughs> yes. And I remember sitting. I would everyone else would go to bed at eleven. I'd set up a chair in front of the television. Because the first time I tried to do it, I fell asleep. And I woke up at like 12, 15. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> so I got, I set up a chair. I got a little, my little TV tray table uh, next to me. And I got a, a bowl of cold water from the sink. And I put it there. And anytime I felt like I was getting drowsy, I dipped my hand in. and just like, splash my face. <laughs> and I'd stay away. Because I had to, you know, I had to be there to see what was going on. Uh, and uh, to watch Mr. Bill. And to, you know, I mean, it was Saturday night. It was such a. It was the coolest thing on television, and even for a twelve-year-old, to stay up until eleven thirty, never mind one, and watch it, and then be able to talk about it. Yeah, it just made me feel like, yeah, 
Mr. Yeah, you're an Mr. adult. Uh, Mr. Culture. Comedy, Mr. Dial yeah. In. yeah, I was the coolest kid. So anyway, so I was always trying to stay up late and watch the Tonight Show. And uh, this is the best Letterman era, you know, the early oh, yeah. days. So uh, I was, I, was uh, I probably watch more late night television than I did. So you're watching you know TV. Like a long haul right. trucker. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> like I gotta get some no dose to get this thing. Oh, again, it was all we had, and I didn't want to, you know, drive off the road and wake up in the morning and be like, I miss, you know, yeah. weekend update. Like, are you kidding me? Because that was it. The that weeknights were the hardest. Like if you were a Letterman fan, like that was brutal. Cause I, was I nice. imagine you didn't have a VCR probably till later. um you know, I think I did, but I don't think it was like programmable at that time. Like you could record, but I couldn't really couldn't really set it up yeah no it was it was tough and in these early years he was only on monday through thursday friday yeah. was friday night videos which was great but it wasn't letterman so uh yeah that was uh, uh i'd step as late as i could it was like a cultural capital in school too like even as a oh. teenager if you had seen letterman which you just seem like the coolest kid on earth. Like people would like gather around you <laughs> as like, like tell us what happened <laughs> Yeah. And it was also like, uh, it was also kind of a trap too. Like if, if you were talking about, you know, Saturday Night Live and someone was like, you know, laughing along and then you'd say like, oh yeah. And that part, and you'd like make up a skit that wasn't on there and they would be like, oh yeah, that was great. I'm like, you fell asleep. I know you did. You know what you said. You, you can't stay up for that. You fell for my trap. Exactly. Get uh, out of here. Yeah. And so 84 SNL, notoriously not a great era, but I kind of have an affinity for that era as well. So uh, yeah. Lauren Michaels wasn't there, uh, 84, 85, which we're looking at here, I think is, uh, this is still the, before the last year where they had like the all stars of like right. Christopher Guest and Martin Short. So we're still dealing with like, uh, Eddie Murphy still on Joe Piscopo, uh, and it's all those basically the Eddie Murphy, Joe Piscopo show I yeah. mean, at this, at, at, towards the end of 84 and rightly so. I mean, uh, Eddie Murphy was. 19 everything i know 19 I mean, he when he was, was on the show it was unreal it's, again it's hard to explain to people but i mean he was so great and so electric and yeah and so 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 young um so what'd you do at eight o'clock at eight o'clock um uh, i'm sure i would have been watching tj hooker um and it was a repeat and i probably had already seen it but um yeah, it's TJ Hooker. It's like the one of the most miscast shows ever, I think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Um it, anybody, uh, pretty much. Uh but um but uh yeah, you know, I watched TJ Hooker and it was one of those you know, it was a cop show and some good stuff, but also some weirdly dark stuff. Like sometimes it went so like that, you know, and you're like, why are they it's eight o'clock on Saturday? Why is he, you know, rousting pimps? And, Oh, there was a lot of like teenage oh, hookers, oh, like yeah, constantly. Teenage, oh my gosh, <laughs> it was, it was it's awful. Yeah, it was. Too, yeah, you know, but then they would do a lot of like really light, like Heather Locklear and uh, and Shatner having like a funny ex like it was. Yeah, the tone was all over the map. It was on that crazy. Story. Yeah. Uh, which you would expect with that cast. Were you drawn to crime stuff and like that sort of stuff, even as a kid? I mean, yes and no. I mean, I kind of was like going through the the listings this week. You know, there's shows like Magnum PI that I just wasn't that interested in. But then like Hardcastle and McCormick, which is a mostly a forgotten show. Yeah, that was I was into it. I mean, I was I was into crime. I think the way everyone is into crime who watches television, it's just it's only crime. Shows. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a perennial. There's Total. never a time in television where there's not a crime show. On. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I was into it, but I wasn't like, especially, you know, drawn to it. I mean, if, if I, if I was going to choose my future profession by my television watching, I, yeah, I don't know. It would have been, uh, it would have been a purser on the love boat or something. <laughs> I, mean, I have no idea. I think it, we it all would be. Yeah, I mean, that seems like a pretty sweet gig. Uh, nine o'clock. Would you do? Love boat. Love boats on at uh, nine. I got to, yeah. uh, I mean, here's the other thing, you know, so we had one television, but also I had two younger sisters. One, uh, my sister Mary's a year younger. My sister Julie is three years younger. So I didn't have total autonomy, you know? So even if I wanted to watch whatever, you know, um, uh, I'd still had to, you know, I had my, my sisters there. So Love Boat was good for, uh, and bad, terrible, but good for all ages because it was so, you know, appreciated. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a true family show in that, 
there really is something for everybody. Cause speaking of tonal shifts, I mean, there'll be <laughs> yeah. a really stupid jokey one. And then like a weird, heavy one. There's yeah. my two favorite examples of love boat three is there's one where there's a guy who is smuggling Doberman pinchers and he has them in his cabin and they're like trained to kill people. And so the whole episode, he's trapped in the bathroom and these like killer Dobermans are in the cabin, <laughs> but it's like really supposed to be scary. And then there's one where these two blind people are engaged, but one of them gets a uh, uh, miracle oh, surgery yes. and can see yep. and doesn't want to tell her there's not blind right. anymore. And then there's one where a kid keeps pretending to kill himself. And like that, he's going to jump off the boat or that he committed suicide. And then someone really does. It's like, how is this oh, on the love God. boat? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, this one, we got Claude Aikens in there. And this is like uh, absolutely uh, post Sheriff Lobo uh, <laughs> having a liquid lunch. Claude Aikens <laughs> on this uh, and Tony Dow, who was yep. uh, leave it to Beaver. Yep. Um, and Wendy Shaw is in this who Joe Dante put in like everything he ever did. Yep. Um, right. this is a pretty standard episode about and, like and, secret. Uh, Didi Khan, the great Didi Khan. Yes. Right. Yes. Didi how Khan. Did she, not, she was in, um, she was in Benson at yep. this time, but how does she never have her own show? She's like one of those personalities that seems like made to have like a show built around. Right? I agree. You know, such a distinct co comedic, but also just really appealing kind of ditzy, you know, but likable, uh, personality she would get cast as wacky neighbor types mm -hmm. but she could handle like a lead like could be like a little bit kooky but a lead like i, I don't know why she never did that's really right, right. weird um but she guest starred on a lot of stuff but yeah she she may have had some pilots that i just didn't know about um i do want to mention hbo showing uh the well-forgotten film and john hughes's first screenwriting credit national lampoon's class reunion <laughs> oh wow which is a slasher parody Yes. <laughs> um, it's not great. <laughs> I think, didn't they try to take their name off that? Or they, they tried they, to take the National Lampoon thing? But, but he was from National Lampoon. Yeah, yeah. And it was based on some stuff he did from National That's Lampoon. Right. As was um, Vacation, which was, you know. Which is great. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah but this is, yeah, post um, Animal House, they were like, mm -hmm. let's do another one. And they did a class reunion, and it is not well remembered um, there's also a show called people are funny on which was a really bad um like candy camera ripoff they were trying to revitalize in the 80s all that 50s stuff this yeah. one was particularly bad uh this is just uh, gangsters uh gagsters first of all never seen the term gagsters before uh include a scientist working with radioactivity hilarious uh who tries to detain the delivery man a model who asks people to retrieve her checkbook from her car occupied by a police dog and this is the craziest one a derelict passing out 20 dollar bills <laughs> who are those jokes and, uh, I th and i th i think it was i think it was hosted by is it hosted by Flip Wilson? I don't. Yes, I don't Flip know. Wilson hosted yeah. that okay. one. Yeah. So Flip, I mean Flip Wilson was his. I mean, I don't even know what else he did in television. But it was, by the eighties, he was well yeah, over. Yeah. Yeah. Was, <laughs> yeah, it was gone. Uh, which is too bad. He was. He was. He was the thing back in his time. But yeah, those are just so awkward. And They're hardly jokes. I, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, this actually, I mean, as we go through, there's a lot of stuff this week. First of all, I think they're throwing stuff in, you know, in June that they that d either didn't make air earlier or they're just burning off, you know, uh, other shows, blooper shows. Yeah. And, um, you know, and Real People is uh, still going, which Oh, is, yes. <laughs> Do you remember when they came to Massachusetts? No. <laughs> they did this whole season that was Real People on a Train. And so they would go, they were like traveling across America on the train. And then like each episode would be in a different state. And so the Massachusetts one, they did like Worcester and Boston. And then they went down to Providence in the same episode. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's pretty amazing. They were all on Amazon prime for a while. I think they might still be, but mm -hmm. my favorite thing about it is how unimpressed all the people here are, <laughs> but it's like John Davidson. They're like, ah, oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> like in all the other cities they're in like oklahoma and they're like the mayor they have a parade and people are like oh well you, you guys filming a show or something and it's just like 
<laughs> we'll move to Providence. Maybe we'll find something there. Exactly. Uh, SNL that night, which is a rerun, but this is Edwin Newman host mm-hmm. uh, and uh, Eddie Murphy, obviously Joe Piscopo. Cool in the gang is the uh, <laughs> the musical guest. Awesome. Love it. And did you notice how many, I mean, this is prime music, the the impact that MTV had on everything. There's so many video shows on all night on a Saturday night, like New York Hot Tracks. Yep. And uh, well, Solid Gold, of course. Uh, night Flight even was uh, sort Flight, of a slightly different yeah, thing, but they did a lot of videos. Yep. Right top 10. And then on the actual MTV <laughs> at 11, uh, Night Ranger in concert from Tokyo. Which, <laughs> But you don't think MTV 1984 Night Ranger. Night Ranger. That was that was eleven o'clock. That was there. Sister Christian Night Ranger. Also 3 a.m. Pro Karate is on the sports network. <laughs> Just noticed that flipping through. Uh what did you do on Sunday? Pro karate. Sunday would be uh so Sunday's a little weird because I mean normally I think I would probably watch Night Rider, but Bad News Bears Go to Japan was on. Now I don't know why 1978. Bad News Bears movie is on primetime in 84 on Sunday night, like prime real estate, but it is. And I, I was too old for it here, but when I was a kid, like we saw all the Bad News Bears movies in the movie theater. And there's no way I would pass up the opportunity to see it again. Because again, if I didn't watch it now, I wouldn't see it again. So it was me watching Tony Curtis uh, leave the uh, uh, lead the uh, the Bears uh, to Japan. To, I don't know. I do, I don't know. This Were there... Three Speaking of cocaine. Yeah, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, why is Tony Curtis in the third Bad News Bears movie? And why is it Japan? I, I, Debts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see um, what they yeah. were from, but there were debts. Uh yeah, it, Knight Rider that night. I do want to mention Lydia Cornell is friend of the show is on who was in uh who was in Too Close to Comfort. She's in that episode. Love Lydia Cornell. Yes. Um I not the Again, I, was, I was 16 at the time. Just oh yes, well that makes perfect sense. <laughs> she was in a bikini in almost every magazine on the rack that year. Uh no pun intended. Um yeah, but they would air anything that was remotely like family friendly. They would try to throw on a Sunday night, and so that's why you got that uh, a six year old Bad News Bears movie. Um, in the same year, uh, Nickelodeon started airing the the Bad News Bears television show from nineteen eighty, like nonstop. Oh, yeah. They're yeah, showing yeah. this like six year old spinoff nonstop, which was weird. Uh, also, if you had cable, which I think you said you didn't, right? No, we did. We oh, uh, did. eighty four. We had cable. It was so great. Uh, HBO premiering that night, the dark crystal <laughs> at eight That's o'clock. Cool. Yeah. That, that would have been, been a big, big deal. deal. <laughs> that would have been a big deal. Uh, um, that would have been a big deal. Yeah. Cable was, I, I guess I could still remember the truck with, uh, coming down the street, literally rolling out cable and they're stringing it up and I'm watching every house get it coming down the street and waiting for it to come into our, <laughs> to our house. And then all of a sudden we had cable and, and it's basically it's just just skip from there to the 21st century because you know, once once we had cable we were all set yeah it's like a fire hose like you're just like drinking from a straw and they turn on the fire hose you're like wait i had five channels and now i have a hundred <laughs> it was it was yeah no it was you know, like you plugged in and all of a sudden you can get it all there there are movies that come on tv nowadays like uh on golden pond um I can't think of any others off the top of my head, but they're movies that I've seen like 13 times because they're always on HBO and they were great. Like Uncle the Pond, great movie, but I saw it so many times and now it comes on. I'm like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot about this movie that I watched every twice day. A day. Yeah. yeah, twice a day for, you know. And months. you never probably would have gone out of your way to see that movie if it just wasn't on no, all the time. Uh, all. Yeah, I remember HBO always showed Finnegan Begin Again. Oh my gosh. <laughs> which they constantly promoted. Uh, and then there's the famous joke that HBO stood for, hey, Beastmaster's on. Because <laughs> uh, Beastmaster. Beastmaster's on nonstop. Beastmaster. Uh, Better Off Dead was on all the time. Just yeah. One of the Guys was on all the time. There was like five movies, yeah. which is nonstop. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so you're watching that all night on Sunday. Um, Sunday, I will, that would be on until, uh, nine, I think it's rough because like the Jefferson's great show. I loved it. Alice, but they were like, this was like season seven, season oh, yeah. eight. And you know how it is. It's like a, a car with three flat tires and smoke coming out of the hood is veering off. To, I mean, it's just, it's <laughs> we love it, viewer. but put it down. <laughs> this is muscle memory. It's like, okay, the Jefferson's wrong. But I mean, it was. Yeah, this weren't these weren't the best uh, episodes. So um, I don't know. I probably 
that's probably what I would, would have watched. What I would have uh, go with Hardcastle and McCormick that night. <laughs> Hardcastle and McCormick. Yeah, I. That's right. It, yeah. It's weird those '70s shows that went into the '80s, and like mm-hmm. Jefferson's, Alice, even Love Boat was still doing new episodes mm-hmm. in '84, '85, which seems so '70s. It seems so yeah. '70s in the '80s, and even in the there were some '80s shows that did that too. Like Dallas, I think went till '92. Miami yeah. Vice went to like '92, which too long. that's way too long. Way too yeah. Long, but- they're like cavemen yeah. when you're watching them there. Uh, that's, that was that was TV then. I mean, you couldn't if you know uh, if it was still pulling whatever. If you were in the top thirty out of 120 shows, you had you know you just had to keep going. I mean, these shows were fascinatingly weird. Sister Sledge is uh, on the Jeffersons that night. Well, that's that's great. <laughs> that's but, I mean, cool. how do they how do they you know? fit them into this i have no idea i can't think of a single because musical people musical guests always guest start on sitcoms and i can't think of a single sick and there's hundreds of them i can't think of a single sitcom that's sort of convincingly managed to make that seem like it made sense that person was guest starring on that show no although i mean we were just talking about square pegs the bar mitzvah episode i mean oh, it was that's kind of true. built around i mean Devo was you know they were going to be on and then they couldn't go and then they showed up. Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe it wasn't convincing, but I was. I that's was, pretty close, cool, though. That's a good. That's a good one. That's much more convincing than like uh, DeBarge on Punky Brewster, <laughs> or um, uh, Tito Jackson. Was it Tito Jackson on um, on Facts of Life when <laughs> Tootie made a sculpture of him and they thought it was a bomb? <laughs> And they tackle her. Ah, uh, yes, there was man. Um, Whitney Houston on Silver Spoons. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Monday night, what'd you do? Oh boy, Monday. Uh, right, so Monday. So yeah. So we're talking about uh, bloopers. Like, I mean, I, I mean, I you know, again, talk about like the TV universe. I was always, I loved it when the fourth wall was broken. Like, no matter what. And like bloopers were kind of cool. I, I remember these to be. Every once in a while, they'd have a special on. It would be like Dick Clark, and he would show bloopers. Then it became a series. And then you, you, sort of quickly, you could tell that these shows were like producing bloopers for these blooper shows. And in turn, the blooper shows were promoting, they were showing bloopers to promote their own network show. Anyway, right. so, yeah, so you run that, out of bloopers eventually. <laughs> you would think so. Yeah. And some of them, you know, you can't air, but these were, you know, I don't know family friendly bloopers. But weirdly, first of all, it pains me to admit that I was watching. These bloopers and practical jokes, but I very likely was. But then at seven thirty, before it, follow ups, bleeps, and blunders was on a different yes. channel. Yes, it, it was in studio guest Lydia Cornell. Yes, there's no way I would have missed that. Of course, she's doing uh, clips from Too Close for Comfort. Other clips include Rock Hudson and Susan St. James from Macmillan and Wife. I assume the blooper is him blurting. I'm gay. Yes, and then they're covering it up quickly. Like, they're like, ah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Blouse of Bleeps and Blunders was a ripoff of Bloopers Breath with Jokes. Don Rickles hosted it, oh, uh, which great. you think won't miss the warmth. There he is. <laughs> um, and, and so that's another reason why Bloopers and Practical Jokes became Bloopers and Practical Jokes, because now there was like a war for bloopers because <laughs> they had all these shows trying to get bloopers. And so in this episode, they do a practical joke on Angelian Cambridge mass is own Angelian uh, and Christopher Atkins. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, they, then they would start showing like commercial foreign commercials yeah. and all kinds yeah. of other stuff just to stretch this concept, uh, which, you know, was pretty stretched out. I would have been super excited now to watch Buffalo bill, which I mm-hmm. didn't watch then. Mm-hmm but was an amazing show mm-hmm. yeah. with Dabney Coleman as just an asshole right. in the way that only Dabney Coleman can be. <laughs> <laughs> and he was really unlikable, but the cast is amazing. Uh, Joanna Cassidy was in it and I believe she won an Emmy for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Julia, uh, not Julia Davis, uh, Gina Davis is in it. Um, just like a cool show that just was too ahead of its time and everybody hated it. Yeah. It was like a, it was like a comedy, but it was, you know, it was a dramedy, I guess, right? Because it was, yeah, I mean, it was funny, but it was also, uh, you know, kind of hard hitting. Danny Coleman is great in everything and, yeah. you know, kind of usually play kind of the same guy. Uh, he was in On Golden Pond. Yep. He was Jane Fonda's husband. Ex husband? I, I think he was their ex husband, yeah. Nine to five. Uh, we could go on. Cloak but, uh, and Dagger. Yeah, <laughs> Cloak and Dagger. Yep. Great. Henry Thomas. 
but he's amazing um, in like um dragnet in the in the dan Aykroyd and um yeah. tom hanks dragnet and he's playing like uh sort of hugh hefner but with this weird southern yeah, accent and that. these weird teeth yeah, and well. like uh, dabney coleman love him uh so you're watching that and that's a full hour and then when you're doing it at nine I, you know i don't know because again look it's one day at a time running on fumes right yep. I mean, new heart not the good you know new heart okay um i i probably <laughs> i don't know why they're showing uh a tv movie from two years ago but angel dusted <laughs> yes a TV movie at nine um with uh with drug abuse shatters the life of an upper middle class family in this emotional drama that's probably something that i would have fallen into i mean so it's gene stapleton mm-hmm. uh, who's a household matriarch it says here and her son owen played by her real life son who i didn't know was an actor a hard driving yet likable college student who seeks a high from pcp a dangerous <laughs> mind-blowing drug more commonly known as angel dust uh i'm sure it was an even-handed telling of uh of, um, yeah, the perils of uh, drug addiction, but there again, drugs. I mean, it's I, I don't know. This I didn't Angel Dust was such a was such a problem. I remember hearing about it as a kid, but it was exactly. like it was like a boogeyman, you know. They'd oh, be yeah. like, people put angel dust in your food, and then you go crazy. Like, but this made for TV movie is so unintentionally hilarious. Oh, uh, it. It's one of Helen Hunt's first roles. Uh, her <laughs> she. She plays a kid named Lizzie who gets dosed with PCP and thinks she can fly and she jumps out a window and it's like this big stunt. But weirdly, it also has uh, an on screen credit for my all time favorite uh, movie trailer voiceover guy, <laughs> Percy Rodriguez. And he okay. plays Dr. Brand. And you might, you probably best know Percy Rodriguez. He did Jaws. So he was like, Jaws. Just what you thought oh, it was. Sure. He's that guy. He would also do all of the Monty Python movies. They had him, they requested Percy Rodriguez for all the Monty yeah. Python movies. And it was so weird to see him on screen, which he was in like a Star Trek episode before that. But awesome to see him in this movie. It's that movie deserves more of a cult audience than it gets. Uh oh, and on Golden Pond connection to Newhart. Uh, you know, the the Vermont set Newhart at the beginning, there's all those shots of Vermont. Those yeah. are B-roll unused footage from On Golden Pond. Really? <laughs> and it's actually shots of New Hampshire. <laughs> they just were like, we need some footage. <laughs> deep that's, dive on Golden Pond. Wow. That's a deep dive. <laughs> uh, so what'd you do on Tuesday? Tuesday. You know, can I, can I just talk about Monday night? Because I, I noticed that thick, yeah. of, of the, thick of the night was in repeats. Yeah. Yes. And I'm like, how long was that? How, does that on television long enough to be in repeats? I looked it up. <laughs> And it was canceled, but they had to run another week of episodes. So they were like running other repeats and it's not in the, this is like, like the, the main uh, edition of the TV guides. So for some reason they weren't running it, but a lot of stations ran a Jerry Lewis talk show for five episodes that, yes. that took the, the thick of the night spot for that week. Um, I think Boston was one of them. Cause I remember watching some of them cause he had, but he had done King of comedy the year before. So now here he is on TV, like being Jerry Langford and being, yes. you know, being Jerry, but eighties Jerry, where he's like, yeah, I'm a tough he's, guy. He's, he's, he's tough. But then if he has someone on who's in showbiz, which everyone was, he just, all he wants to talk about is how hard it is, you know, yeah. putting on the makeup or, you know, getting out there every night and getting laughs and you people are, you know, it's like on and on and on. And Charlie Callis is his Andy Richter. Oh my God. It's unbelievable. It's so good. Um, I need to so see that. I wonder if there's that. footage online. Cause they got to be oh, like oh, in their fifties. There is. Jerry was, yeah. Jerry was in his fifties and Charlie Callis was like in his sixties. And with both those guys, a little goes a long way. Oh yes. Uh, five yeah. nights, five hours is just one week. Cause think of the night was terrible. Oh, oh so, oh, it so was, bad. it was a, it was basically a, a manufactured, uh, letterman. They were, they imported Alan thick. They tried to do this irreverent show to the point where the ads for it, when it first started, literally said, look out, Johnny, yeah. like there's a new kid in town and all this stuff like that, which is insane. And then there was pretty much mud wrestling in like every episode. Mm-hmm. And he had a, every week he had a different comedian co-host and oh. Arsenio Hall ended up doing it All right. for like half the run of the show, which is a major reason why he ended up getting his own talk show um, when he replaced Joan Rivers on her Fox show. Right. But 
other than that, like oh. what a terrible show. I mean, Canadian Letterman just doesn't make any sense. There's no, no such, there's no, uh, that's not a, that's just impossible. Uh, it's a contradiction. Yeah. In, and it's uh, certainly not Alan Thick. <laughs> uh, no, it's not Alan Thick. <laughs> so that goes off the air and then somehow he, he falls into, he fall into it, but somehow as Jerry Lewis would say, he worked very hard and then got <laughs> people didn't appreciate uh, it. Whatever. Uh, who's the growing boss? pains, and growing pains, growing pains. Growing pains yeah. You. Yeah, because before that, he really he had written a couple theme songs. He wrote "Facts of Life." He wrote "Different Strokes," right. That's right, uh, too. and his wife at the time did that song, "Friends and Lovers." Gloria Loring. Yes, yep. um, and so he was like, a, "It was just a weird choice to make him host yeah. a talk show." I, like I don't get it, um, but I need to see that Jerry Lewis show now. Um, mm-hmm. But yes, thank you for mentioning the late night on Monday. <laughs> so Tuesday, what'd you do? Tuesday, well, eight o'clock. Follow-ups, <laughs> leaps and blunders. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, how, it's it seems summer. crazy to, that there was a, that much of a of an audience, but I, I think I was probably in it. And it's Missy Gold, who was in Benson, mm-hmm. Randolph Mantooth, who was an emergency, which was 15 years before this. I have no idea what he was in. Um, that's on. I mean, it's really not. I mean, it's. I wasn't into the A team. Didn't really do it for me. And uh, the Nova uh, uh, featuring Elizabeth Kubler Ross talking about uh, the stages of grief and dying I, this wasn't really that wasn't my thing <laughs> at no, 16 you don't want to see a pbs show about the tibetan book of the dead <laughs> you know i i didn't it's crazy i just wasn't that into it um but psycho 2 was on hbo so i mean psycho 2 is pretty good i i i, I was a huge psycho fan and uh, psycho 2 was fun so i was probably watching some of that or maybe again three's companies on but you know priscilla barnes is like the third chrissy and you know, they're just going through the motions, trying to keep, uh, trying to keep that ball in the air. The other thing is, this was uh, this was the uh, this was the night of the uh, Game Seven uh, NBA Finals, Celtics and the Lakers. So, if I was to teleport back there, I would watch myself watching that for sure. I was definitely watching right. basketball. But if basketball, if that had been on, and then, uh, then uh, yeah, I probably would have watched that. And it's or Red Sox Yankees that night too. <laughs> yeah. Well, that I would watch that too. Although, being who I am now, if I did go back in time, I would have broken away to watch a little bit of Hotel because I have to see a silver anniversary couple played by Margaret O'Brien and Donald O'Connor wanted to recreate their wedding day, which included a performance by Liberace. Yes, <laughs> yes. Pull away from NBA, watch that, and then get right back to uh, yeah, that is unmissable. That's one of those TV plots that sounds like a weird dream you're describing to somebody. Like I was, I was having a 40th wedding anniversary and yeah. Liberace, it didn't make any sense, but it's a real show. Uh, one thing, Missy Gold is now a psychiatrist in Portland, Maine. Really? Uh, so if you need, uh, she, she does do zoom, uh, if she has room on her roster and people want to awesome. be, uh, right. be, have a therapist of Missy Gold, um, <laughs> the A team that night, they, the weirdest thing about the. The way they describe this episode, I know is not accurate because it says the sophisticated commando tactics that the gang uses for petty holdups suggest they're preparing for a bigger game. Uh, the sophisticated should never be anywhere near uh, the A team. But also in that follow up sleeps and blunders, Robert Urick, Howard Hessman, and Dan Aykroyd mm, yeah. uh, in clips. And to your point earlier, there is a pilot they're burning off here. This is an unsold pilot that they're showing on ABC and it's called welcome to paradise. Three young adventurers Island hopping in the South Pacific, discover a body and become embroiled in a search for a stolen museum artifact, not on CBS's announced fall schedule. So this is clearly like, Hey, let's take Magnum PI and mix it with Indiana Jones. (laughs) (laughs) Which they would do all the time. It was, it was, it was so predictable. Yeah. Whatever the hit movie was next fall, there was a, a pale imitation or an unholy clone of two popular movies. Um, or they would just do, you know, animal house, the TV show, which was the worst case scenario. Delta house is bad, real bad, but it's the first on-screen appearance by Michelle Pfeiffer. In really, she's in Delta House, the Animal House TV series. That's the first one. Huh? Um, huh. And I will say, the Fast Times at Ridgemont High TV series, Fast Times from '87, is 
really great. Oh. <laughs> it was seven episodes. It's sort of everything you wanted square pegs to be, but was it shot on film, single cam, no laugh track, mm-hmm. uh, Amy Heckerling and Cameron Crowe wrote it. <laughs> it has all the teachers from the movie are still in it. Vincent Chiavelli. Right. It's Mr. got, Hand. yeah, Mr. Hand is in it. Um, it, <clears throat> it's just really good. Oh. Uh, but uh, very unloved. Good on go bongo theme song. Uh, AKA Pablo, poor Paul Rodriguez. Um, anything else on Tuesday? Not, I mean, uh, the pack sports night. That's but uh, yeah, I mean, that would have been it. I mean, heart to heart is on, and heart to heart was we were talking about it earlier. Heart to heart always, even in the 80s, felt to me like it, like it was 10 years past due, like it had yeah. spun off the CBS mystery wheel, the Columbo cloud, and uh, McMillan and wife. And we have no room for heart to heart, so we'll put that on 10 years later. It's just, yeah. it, it just always felt like it had already been done. It's a relic. It's, it's, it's like a kid in college coming to a high school party. I got, I, I was invited once to, uh, I got a call, you know, asking if I was a heart to heart fan. I always say yes. You know, like, well, we're going to, you know, thinking about, um, you know, redoing it and doing a feature if you want to, you know, come in. And I don't know what I said at the moment, but my mind was like, no, like, what? There's no heart to heart movie. Like, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. the thinnest of conceits anyway. Rich There's people nothing... solving mysteries because they're just bored. <laughs> In 2020, that's even less. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't it's, even know where to start. It's basically someone goes, okay, take Batman, right? Uh, make him married. Doesn't do the vigilante stuff, but he's super rich. It's just okay. Bruce Wayne and his wife, and they solve murders sometimes for fun. <laughs> but they're As super rich. And I'm like, I, what? Uh, yeah, not not my favorite. Uh, Wednesday, we got real people. Did you do it? <laughs> did, did you read? I please tell me that you read the uh, the description for real people. Oh my god, I did. Here's, okay, so it's, <laughs> it's reports on a wild turkey calling contest. Mm-hmm. The laid back people of Key West, Florida, <laughs> gripping uh, a female drill instructor at West Point. A female at West Point. That's crazy. Well, it's got to be. It can't be true. Um, uh, a, a New Hampshire, a New Hampshire zucchini festival, <laughs> not a porn shoot. I think it's, an, it's nope. an actual zucchini festival. Uh, an 85 year old waitress. Who's also hold on a radio news reporter. It's impossible. Okay. Then it's fiction. And then the, the capper an unusual English blog house. <laughs> this like, is like Mad Libs. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, exactly. Just it's throw like a, a bunch magazine of terms. show, but it's just, I mean, it's the worst magazine you, you could ever uh, pick up in the worst doctor's office anywhere. I don't know. I, I, I was, I was much more of a that's incredible guy. Cause that's yeah. incredible. They would have these, you know, they had this guy called the Yogi Kudu. You remember this? Oh, yeah. this and guy? the little box himself into the box. That was awesome. Yeah, and they had uh, stunts. Zucchini Festival, not so, not so much. Not yeah, the New Hampshire much. Zucchini Festival sounds like the worst jam band on earth. Uh, <laughs> like, like your college roommate's awful jam band. <laughs> You're like, I, re- I can't go see you guys play. I'm sorry, uh, New Hampshire Zucchini Festival. <laughs> and I also well, would have been, I would have been watching the Fall Guy for sure. Uh, there's no question. Uh, again, I'm 16. Heather Thomas. I see Marky Post was on the show, yep. and it's just Lee Majors. I'm still. I'm still six million dollar man fan that carries over into you know, the fall guy. And so, do you, as a six million dollar fan, six million dollar man fan, do you get as annoyed as I do where you see that article mm, every two years or so that it was like, how much would the six million dollar man be today? <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> it'd be like, exactly. It'd be the adjusted for billion. inflation. Yeah. And I'm like, why, why do we care about this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really tiring. Although I was, so as I say, it's my, I can't tell the whole story, but my favorite TV show of all time. And I found out they've done, they've gone through various iterations of trying to make it a yeah. movie and reboot it and re-update it. And there was one that was, that they were talking about happening. And I, I called my agent, I wrote all the stuff. I literally talked my way into the job and I had it. And it was mine. And I was writing a $6 million man movie for not very long. And, uh, but I wasn't officially hired. I can't really, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I, but I jumped in with another writer and we were doing it. We were so excited, excited. And then out of nowhere, uh, the Weinsteins just like fired us. Now I hadn't been hired, but I was fired by the Weinsteins <laughs> and just gone. And we're off the uh, project and we hadn't really produced anything, but I was, it was just so 
it's so close. That all went west south. And it's probably for the best because that would have been a terrible situation. But just getting it, the watching the $6 million man, it was literally the first show I can remember watching the promo on TV. And it was, he was falling down the stairs in slow motion. And I remember like, like yelling, Mom, you know, when is Friday at nine o'clock? You know, will you tell me? Because I had no, there's no other yeah. way to do it. And watched it. And so, just to be, you know, to like grab onto that and to uh, and to have had the chance was like super exciting. That was really uh, like your adult self going back and telling exactly. yourself as a kid, like exactly. you get to write this. Something. There's nothing going to have with it, but you'll someone it was, will just, want you to write it. Just, just the fact that, yeah, the fact that I would be near anywhere near anything that had to do with movies or anything. Never mind. And I mean, the six million dollar man. That was awesome. Still they, was awesome. The Bionic Woman show from a few years back was okay-ish. I don't know if you remember oh, the that. Reba, I yeah. didn't, I it didn't was watch. okay. It was I just I feel like it's such a 70s concept, like it'd be really hard to make work uh now unless you made it a period piece, which well, I had a really I had a really I had a really cool time. I'm sure you did. I'm I sure was, you did. I was ready to go. Um and, and I am ready to go. Call it call it something else and you do it. Exactly. <laughs> that's how we do it. Uh, so that's real people and fall guy. Lee majors oh, is, is great. Yeah. And it was like the power couple still with Farrah Fawcett, uh, clue Gulliger's in this episode who people yeah. know from it's an old cowboy actors return to living dead and a ton of other stuff, uh, showed up on episodic TV nonstop at this yeah. time. Uh, anything else on Tuesday? Not, I mean, Oh, Wednesday. No, either. I mean, there really wasn't much. The only other, thing that I remember was the duck factory, which was a very limited series. You probably know about it with and Jim Carrey was in the lead super early Jim Carrey, like straight off the bus from Canada. I assume like when he started out, he was like a very, like he was always just like innocent sort of character on shows. He would pop up in 10 years later, of course, you know, but um, that was, a, it was, it was an interesting show. It was kind of a little Buffalo bill like, and that it wasn't all, it wasn't just, you know, Kind of story that went along but you know any anything different at, at that point on television i was like drawn to because everything was the same you know I mean, yeah was, everything was the same so, and that show stood out because it was it was pretty smart it was it was yeah. based on the jay ward animation studio in los angeles who did uh, buffalo uh buck uh bullwinkle and um yeah and so it's it's jim carrey is like a young animator who comes and works at this old animation studio jay tarsis was in it which was rare like he did very rarely showed up on screen um mm -hmm. Teresa ganzel was in it who i've had on the show um and it would be this shot on camera shot on film single camera sitcom that would then be interspersed with sort of mini episodes yeah, of this yeah, animated yeah. cartoon yeah it was real weird it and, was I'm not surprised it didn't work, but yeah. it in the nineties comedy central bought it and aired it nonstop for about two years, like every day, just the 15 episodes over and over and over <laughs> and over again. Um, and I, I kind of got around to, to enjoying it. Uh, Thursday, what'd you do? Oh my gosh. Thursday. Um, Thursday's rough. Thursday is not a lot, you know? Uh, so Cinemax uh, somehow was running, was showing SCTV. I don't know if they were just, repackaging it and putting this it was a new Max? season it was the final was season it? of sctv um i'm the I, sctv is my favorite everything oh. and um after the third iteration which was network 90 which was the mm -hmm. one that was on nbc where they were trying to get them to replace snl yep. it got canceled again and then it was a joint production between super channel in canada and cinemax and it was a really stripped down cast so it's just eugene levy uh andrea martin uh and martin short that and, wow. and uh joe flaherty that's it and so you would have little guest spots by dave thomas and um and stuff but it's some of the funniest sketches I've ever seen on SCTV or in that season of SCTV, they had free reign to go real weird. So there's a couple episodes that are just one sketch. <laughs> like there's an episode that is an entire hour long parody that is a mashup of Porky's and Das Boot. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called Das Booty. And it's like a whole hour of this church. It's crazy. And then there's one called It's a Wonderful Film that's like a parody. They're making a sequel to It's a Wonderful Life. And it's like a it's just crazy that they got away with this stuff. Um oh there, there's just some great sketches on that. Uh the Soren Weiss report, uh just great Martin Short weirdness. Um, but yeah, that that season of Cinemax is is gold 
and I loved I as big as an SNL fan I was SCTV was like that was everything yeah I mean I for me it just live TV gets the edge but it was so great but for a time where we live here in Boston it was like after SNL was over like the SCTV come on or something I, I yeah remember they would air the half hour shows uh yeah, at 1 a.m like yeah soon after which was great i mean what's better uh, that was- <laughs> there's there's a there's a sketch in this in this particular episode of sctv that's uh, a game show called the date debate and it's like a dating game type game show and uh joe flaherty's playing this like real sleaze and dr kinsey of the Kinsey report is like the celebrity judge. (laughs) So Joe Flaherty's this sleaze and he goes, I picked a girl up at eight 30 and drop her off at 10. And what happens in between is my business. (laughs) And then he just goes to, he goes, Hey, Dr. Kinsey. And she's like, when he just starts making like kissy face, it's just so bizarre. (laughs) It's just great. I love it. The Uh, worst thing for me as like someone who, you know, works at home and is a writer and doesn't really have someone standing over his shoulder is if I'm like looking something else up and I come across an SCTV clip, it's like the most dangerous thing that could happen to my work day because gone. You just keep going. Yeah. And then yeah. another one and another one. And it's uh I have to fight hard to uh write <laughs> stay on track. Have you ever gone on a rat like gone down a rabbit hole on like something like that, but it actually ended up um like inspiring you to write something else? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean there's been uh yeah, I mean <laughs> uh not as often as it should because normally it just ends up normally I'll just like end up probably at the $6 million man, you know, like everything yeah. sort of like <laughs> yeah. all my interest all roads and, all lead there. and I'm watching, you know, season four, Lee majors with a mustache, uh, uh, jumping things. But, um, but yeah, no, I mean, things have definitely, uh, um, I can't think of a great example, but it's usually something that I weirdly had passed me by and that I hadn't heard of. And I look into it and I'm like, what? And then it kind of opens up, you know, a whole new thing that I, that I didn't, uh, I didn't know about. I was during the pandemic, I had time finally to go back and uh, not to go back, but to write a, a novel, which I hadn't done in like for 10 years. I've been involved in television movies and it's set in 1978. And so there again, it was like playing with dynamite, you know, I have all this great research, but oh my gosh, I could go, you know, I could just go on forever and live in 1978 and not uh, you know, have anything to show for it. But it was so much fun and it was so cool to uh you know just go back and look things up and and you know set this book at a certain time and know what was going on at that time there's so many resources out there so it's great do you so do you fun. prefer to write like a historical thing like that for that reason or is it just kind of I've like actually never no i mean this is the first sort of historical thing that i've done it for fiction so um um no it was uh you know it, it was really, it was really cool to to go back to a time that I remember as a kid, but to have all these, as I say, these you know resources uh, to 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 sort of pull up what was going on then, and uh, because it's set, it's based on a real thing that happened uh, with a fictional element thrown in. So, so I had free reign, you know, to to uh, to use real stuff and then create other stuff. And, uh, definitely got me through uh, some uh, quarantine weeks. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Were you a big horror kid growing up? Oh yeah. Huge. Okay. Huge, yeah. Huge, huge. Yep. Uh, that was, yeah, uh, it was, <clears throat> it was all horror for me. Were you mostly reading or going to movies or? No, mostly you... going to movies. I mean, for sure. Uh, um, especially, you know, like Italian horror. I don't yeah. know. You were, I think you're Mario you're Bava. <laughs> very, you're much younger than I am, but in like the mid mid eighties, no early, like early mid eighties, they were releasing a lot of Italian horror movies unrated. So I yep. go to like the Dead and Showcase and, uh, and watch like these. the Dario Argento, Lucio Fulci stuff. Like Fulci, mo- mostly. Yeah. yeah. Like Fulci, like city of the living dead. And, um, but, uh, those movies, there's one, I think, I think it's, I think pieces. is the one. <laughs> Yeah. Pieces yeah. is the weirdest free movie. On oh, Earth. It's so weird. I mean, everyone's seen is it pieces that was filmed in Part of it was, was filmed in Dedham. Like it yeah, starts off. It's Boston. pieces. It's pieces. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so I'm in Dedham watching this Italian horror movie and I'm still trying to figure out why they're speaking English, but it's Italian. And, that, and all of a sudden, like I just rode on the street and in the horror movie, you know, this guy's driving down the street and I'm like, what the, what? Yeah. Like, it was, it was a truly unsettling, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, because because House by the Cemetery is set in Boston, but didn't. There's like a couple of yes. of like stock shots, but yeah, they they filmed parts of pieces of pieces uh, <laughs> in Dedham for some bizarre reason. Yeah. Oh God, that movie. I two two comedic comedy friends of mine had never seen that. They're not horror movie guys, and they, I recommended it to them and in, in lockdown, and mm-hmm. they were like, I don't know what the fuck I just saw, mm-hmm. but it's my favorite thing I've ever. Like that was the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's up there. Yeah, it's just uh, there's a lot going on there. That, that's the one that starts with the kid, the puzzle, the puzzle, right? Yeah, yep. chops up. And, and that then, final yeah. shot, there's like a oh, there's yeah. a kung fu guy. Like it's just crazy. It's crazy. Um, and I'm a huge Argento fan. Uh-huh. Um, and it was it was there was a weird blip where you could see like opera uncut in the movie theater. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> weird. It was really it was really. It was really weird, but it was great. I mean, it was the perfect time for me because I was, you know, no girlfriend, <laughs> uh, nothing <laughs> else to do <laughs> except go to, you know, go to uh, a terrible. It was actually the first, <laughs> the first date that I took, uh, first real date that I went on. Not the first date that I went on, but the first date that I went on with a woman who is now my wife, <laughs> setting off the uh, smoke detector in the house. <laughs> we went to go see uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part five a new beginning which oh. was uh, a perfect you know first date movie she the was, sleazy one <laughs> she was terrified and uh and it was yeah plus there was nothing else playing that that week so that um, one is directed by danny stein i think uh who see? did who did um savage streets and had done like a bunch of oh. porn movies before that but i i didn't know that the boston mob <laughs> owned friday the 13th really <laughs> so they ran this thing called hallmark pictures when i was like 19 i'm like i'm gonna write a book about the combat zone and then i was doing all, i was trying to interview all these old guys who were like what are you talking to me for but i found out that so sean cunningham was a huge mob guy and he used to make porn reels for the mob and help them uh launder stuff as did wes craven which is how he knew them yeah. and they made they made uh, a couple of porn movies and so the the mafia group was called hallmark pictures and they owned most of the combat zone and and stop me if this is super boring um and they mostly had the film production to to launder money so they released a bunch of italian movies like mark of the devil they released here um a lot of the blind dead movies if you've ever seen those those spanish movies knights templar spanish movies like Mm -hmm. zombie movies um but they produced last house on the left and they wanted it to be a a porno movie which is why there's like three porno actors in that movie and cunningham and uh wes craven started it as a porno movie and then we're like hey we can make more money if we don't have any sex in it and they were like fine so that's how they started getting into like i guess you call them mainstream movies but uh and they made friday the 13th so they owned the rights to friday the 13th till part wow. seven when they sold them back to paramount and if you ever see sean cunningham or any of those people who dealt with them at that time they always refer to them as the people from boston <laughs> <laughs> They're like, and then the people from Boston had some ideas. Uh-huh. So they hired Danny Stein to direct that because they, they he had made like uh, these like really gross porno movies for them. And the uh they used to just cook the book so much that Paramount was like, You're telling us this movie didn't make any money. I don't understand. And they they distributed uh Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they distributed Night of Living Dead, and they were just just converting cash and washing money through it. And it's this crazy story. Um, but they came up with that. It's only a movie tagline. And when they released Mark of the Devil, the, the gag was you got a vomit bag with Mark of the Devil on it. And to this day, you will still find those bags around in this area. And really? There's a jewelry that it's closed now, but there was a jewelry store down in Providence that would give people the jewelry in those little vomit bags. <laughs> and you're like, gee, how did these get here? Who owns this place? <laughs> so just that whole story is crazy. But yeah, That's part great. five is is the most guys from Boston one uh, of all the Friday the 13th movies. It's just it has that like gross, like um, although I remember the beginning, you know, yes. I mean, they had to they they'd killed, I think. Four ended with wasn't it Corey Corey, uh, Corey Feldman Feldman yep like chopped him up and then part five you know it's, it's fake Jason imposter uh, I remember seeing that in the theater and the kid who played yeah. Dudley on Different Strokes is in it yes and this yes. person in the audience was so upset that Dudley 
might yeah. get killed. They yeah. were, they were like, don't <laughs> kill Dudley. Like they went insane. Uh, Dudley, it, was, wow. it was great. Poor Dudley. Uh, <laughs> so Friday night, final night of the week. What'd you do? Again, I'm 16. I, I hope, I hope I wasn't home watching television, but I probably was watching Benson. Again, Benson, good show. I, 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 Robert Guillaume is great. Benson, I, I, I don't know. I, I was done. It was one of those shows that like created its own little world to spin off of soap. He was like one of the funniest characters on soap because he was the only one who wasn't completely insane. So he was always doing that thing where he would like look at them, you know, and he kind of carried that character over into uh, into the governor's mansion. <clears throat> Excuse me, and Benson. And this but was yeah, the was repeat Benson. of the final episode of Benson. The final, final one? one. Yep. This is the last show of the series. Do you remember how it, what, what did they wind it up or no cliffhanger yeah. ended on a cliffhanger. So a lot of shows, a lot of shows oh. ending this, 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 uh, or, or should have been. Ending. Yeah. 80, 45 was a huge transitional year. Yeah. And, um, the whole season of that last season of Benson, Benson's running for governor against right. the governor. Oh, I totally remember that. And so the final episode is the election night and they're reading the results and then it screen goes black. Wow. It's a, you don't know who won and it was supposed to be next year. I think their plan was, I found out later Benson would win and he would be the governor, but we never knew <laughs> it was a real bet they placed. So funny. Uh, and yeah, they're re-airing that, which would have just been infuriating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I big on Benson. Um, and, and then, then what, what do? do I do at eight 30? Like Webster's on, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, 16 is too old for Webster. I'm not watching. It's, <laughs> there's no Webster. So I, I, I would have limped along until probably watch Dallas or something. Blue Thunder, again, movie into television. Um, yeah, I mean, Friday night, you know, uh, basically that's, I mean, Matt Houston is on a 10. Matt Houston is another rich guy. You know what? I'm going to solve crimes because yeah. I've already made my my money. <clears throat> and Lee Horsley, he was he was like one of those, you know, you take, you take Lee Majors, you take Tom Selleck. You got Lee Horsley. He's we got, need a cowboy Tom Selleck. <laughs> he's got the mustache. He's yeah. got everything. He's got that. It was good. I mean, that was a fun, that was a funnish uh, show. And again, it's like he, his old friend is being framed for a, a drug theft. It's just like, yeah, it was a big problem. Uh, and, and, it was, I, I don't know how accurate it represented problems because it was in everything and it's hard to tell. Um, but also, uh, the Frank Langella, John Badham Dracula is on. Yes. Uh, again, uh, weirdly. I mean, why is that on? I, and it's on PBS. It's, it's on, on PBS. PBS. Yes. It's I mean, on WGBH for some reason. I don't know. Uh, I mean, yeah. Okay, very movie, weird. But, but Not so my favorite strange. Dracula. Uh, no. uh, Frank Langella doesn't do it for me in that track. I like him. No. Just not as Dracula. Um, I also want to mention <laughs> one of the worst sketch comedy shows of all time is on Cinemax that night. And it's one of the worst sketch comedy shows of all time, mostly because of the name. Mm -hmm. And it's called Assaulted Nuts. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it was Cinemax oh. attempt to do, like, not necessarily the news. So image conscious advisors urged the president to don a fishing cap and smoke a pipe while announcing the imminent arrival of Soviet warheads. This oh, is cutting edge stuff here. Uh, and just awful. Do you have, do you have any idea who, who or what? Or I don't who? think anyone of note came from that show. Uh, it, it was no one. And I don't think it was like even anyone from like groundlings or SC, uh, second city. It was just like, I don't know where the people from that show came from. Um, I don't think any really want to do much, but Cinemax really pumped a lot of money into it. They tried to pair it with SCTV um, because the, the, the deal they made with SCTV was we're doing one season and the SCTV people knew that they were all doing movies and stuff. And so Cinemax was like, what we'll do is we'll get those SCTV viewers and we'll introduce them to our amazing comedy show, assaulted nuts. Right. <laughs> and that'll go on for decades. Right. That didn't, it didn't work. Assaulted um, nuts. <laughs> is there a, is there a, a horror movie that you think would make a good TV series that, because that's the hardest thing to do ever. It's a hard to adapt a movie into a TV series in general because of like the plot. A hard movie into it? Uh, wow, I really, I don't. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I would probably, I would go back to like this era if I was going to do it now, and it wouldn't just pick one movie, but it would be like a, like a slasher series, you know. So uh, you can like play with conventions and uh, and um, 
with fun stuff like that, uh, that would be, uh, which I think would would work, especially if you said it in the uh, in the eighties. That'd be fun. Slash your favorite genre? Not really, but I think that's that's one that you can you can do a lot with because it can be. I mean, it's it's fun in quotes because yeah. it's just fun. It's like who's going to die next? Who, how are they going to die? Who's going to die? Who's going to get the spirit through the eye? Who's going to you know fall into the bear trap? Um, but it's also you know it's uh, so there's like a almost a I guess a Christie aspect to it, right? But um, you know, but it's scary and there's chases and stuff. And it's just that 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 seems seems fun to me. I, I like I like I mean I like to be scared, but I like fun horror. I don't like when it's like so grim and dark. And me either. <laughs> it's just it's just not fun. I noticed curtains was on like three times this yes. week. Yes, uh, curtains. I saw Cinemax. curtains. I saw curtains at, you know, at the Braintree uh, movie theater. I remember it was. That was a scary movie when I saw it. That it mask like, is horrifying. Yeah, that was mask. one of the classic Canadian tax shelter slasher movies. Oh, <laughs> With Happy Birthday one. to Me. Also great. Yeah, that was a good one. The curtains is the one with the skating, right? Where yep, what comes out with the mask. Yeah, old man mask. and the, Yeah, horrifying. Really creepy. Um, really yeah. Terrifying. I, I, there were so many of those weird movies that aired for uh, one of the things I've been doing in lockdown is I, I got a, uh, an account at newspapers.com and I've just been going through the movie listings from the old Boston globes. And I love the late seventies, early eighties one, seeing these super obscure horror movies that I didn't, I was shocked to see it played in a theater at all. Um, playing in a lot of the drive-ins theaters and stuff and curtains was one of them. But, uh, th- there's a bunch of like really obscure movies that I'm like that played here, like nightmare and <laughs> like, like, weird stuff. Um, but man, I love it. Were you a Fangor? Were you a Fangoria kid? <laughs> Um, you know what got me into Fangoria was Gates of Gates of Hell. It was released as Gates of Hell here at the City of the Living, Living Dead. Dead. I think I uh, saw that and it blew my mind. It was so crazy. And then we would go. I remember my parents. We were driving somewhere. We were going on like a little trip, and we stopped at a convenience store. And I'm at the magazine rack, and there's a picture of character Bob from the movie, the guy who the drill gets the drill exactly on the cover. And I'm like, <laughs> in slow motion, reach for that magazine. And read it and subscribed. And the coolest thing about that, you know, the coolest thing about Fangoria was when you subscribed, you got a you got a free, like three line classified ad, basically. And it's really, if I think about it, it's the first time I I was ever any of my writing was ever published. Even though it's writing, but I was like, you know, it's like a shout out to like my favorite bands and movies. <laughs> and you put it in there, and then it was there. I'm like, I got, I'm published. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I'm in Fangoria. <laughs> so, yeah. I hope and that's years, still on your resume. Years later, years later, Guillermo and I, Guillermo del Toro and I were interviewed. So I was in Fangoria and I met Tom Savini. And I was like, wow. Again, it was one of those moments. Yeah. Everything, was, everything that I wanted to happen. Uh, suddenly happened. <laughs> Comes full circle. And it's all really through cool. print medium, which is really how we, we made friends mm-hmm. then. Uh, well, thank you for doing this. It's been great talking to you. Uh, thank you, Ken. It was really a lot of fun. Uh, and um uh, thanks for asking me. It was fun to not talk about myself and crime and horror and to get into uh, really bad television. Films. Yeah, which is a whole different kind of horror and crime. <laughs> <laughs> it's time. Again, it's fun horror. Yes. Which, uh, I like. But uh, no, it was a trip. Really. Thanks so much. There you go. That's Chuck. Buy his books, Prince of Thieves, The Strain, all of his stuff. Uh, just just put in Chuck Hogan uh, into your Google machine and it will tell you all the things that he has written and you should read them all. Um, that's about it. I'll see you next time for a brand new edition of TV Guidance Counselor. When you think of milk, you think of, <laughs> of Vincent Price. <laughs>